we have a lot of interesting conflicts and synergies coming. And I could go on and on on that. What do you do about that one? We have geothermal, we have variable refrigerant volume. It's slightly more efficient than your DX systems. It can be used in larger things. Hybrid cooling towers, uh, cooling ponds. We have a lot of different things we can do. You know, probably the biggest one is to uh, do energy conservation. Every time you take one ton hour of cooling out of a building, you're saving every hour that it operates, you're saving about two, two and a half gallons of water. Think of it that way. That's a lot. And the other things that we can do is look for alternate sources of water. We've talked about reclaimed water. Alternate on-site sources are coming more and more popular. We're going to have a lot of talks about gray water, but you have air conditioning, condensate, foundation drain water, all types of things out here that can be used in your cooling towers. University of Texas at Austin uh, collects AC condensate, foundation drain water, and a little rain water and a couple other things and gets 130,000 gallons of water a day out of the system. Baylor Medical Center, uh, Houston, Texas, a very hot and extremely humid area. They, uh, you know, you, you look at the forecast and it'll say 100, that's the humidity. Then I don't care what it is, the temperature will be something else, you know. But uh, you're extracting water out of there. 20% uh, of their total cooling tower makeup comes from the AC condensate. A lot of different things out there. I have to make this final comment, and this concludes my talk. We all talk about reclaimed water. I'm 100% for reclaimed water. The problem we're running into in a lot of places is we don't have enough sewage. Where, in fact, uh, there are some classic legal battles. Uh, the reuse of reclaimed water is now in Texas and being become known is the Lawyer's Permanent Employment Act. John's laughing back here because he knows what I'm talking about. Houston, Dallas, I mean, the Dallas Fort Worth area in the middle of summer, 95% of the flow in the Trinity River is treated effluent from the Dallas Fort Worth area when it's not raining. It flows to Lake Livingston, which becomes a major water supply for the city of Houston, and John drinks it. And yeah, it tastes good. And uh, by the way, Dallas and Fort Worth wanted to do a massive reuse project. Houston sued, and it went all the way to the Texas Supreme Court. It was finally settled out of court and with a lot of legislation. And the same battles are going on all over the Southwest over who owns the sewage. And who would have ever thought that we'd have gotten down to this state? And with that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I, I just have to say I thank you, and I will open it for any questions. <laughs> I, think, I think I got you on time, didn't I? Is that over? Yeah. Just, a hair, just a hair over. I'm sorry. Bill, this is Michael Kellerman with Insyncrator. Given your extreme case of water use on the garbage grinders, uh, I want to uh, just mention that certainly that was an egregious use of water. Um, mm -hmm. I would say it was an extreme, extreme case, and I'm curious if in your worldly travels of seeing these, uh, all these things that you mentioned, uh, are you familiar with the AquaSaver technology, and are yeah. you a, a supporter of that? Yeah, by the way, and you want to talk to him about this, he's going to have a program tomorrow. The AquaSaver actually uh, shuts down most of the water use uh, flow into the uh, garbage disposer while it, when it's not loaded. It, it, de it depends on the load, so it can help reduce it. You have pulper situations uh, and uh, also the salvage yard type equipment, which recirculates water back and forth uh, to use to uh, wash the dishes down with and everything. And, and I did mention in there, there are a lot of good reasons for using a garbage disposer. I'm not going to take that away from it. You know, I'm just saying, be aware. It, and that was the main comment here, is be aware of what these things can be using. And uh, I'm sure you've seen the misapplication where you have the 10 horse uh, thing putting down 8 gallons a minute, and they should have had a 2 horse motor. Yeah. Okay, did I, everybody else? Gee whiz, thank you. Um, a very informative presentation. Um, I, I'm struck by the fact that I think people in general, the public is aware of, of energy uh, shortage or, or you know, the, the expense of energy and getting more aware of the shortage of water, but maybe don't make that connection that, you know, water uh, requires energy. Can you talk a little bit about that and how, how the public can kind of learn about that more? Well, you know, uh, the first part of your question is, yes, the public does uh, is not totally aware of this, and the whole connection of you need water to make energy and energy uh, to move water around and treat it and make it available. And uh, 
It's going to be a, a continually, increasingly important topic. First place, both those entities, the, uh, you know, cost of energy and the cost of water keep going up. And uh, the other one is, is that a lot of times, particularly now in the energy field, one of the more interesting ones is that some of the things we think are just whiz bang and uh, slam dunk things to do, such as uh, I, I gave the example of ethanol. If you irrigate landscape, I mean irrigate the crop there, it's a thousand gallons of water to make one gallon of ethanol. Well, that's not a sustainable way of going about it. So there's a lot of different things we have to look at more carefully, and I think that really is where I was trying to get with my presentation was we all need to become more aware of these energy and water relationships and how they affect us so we can make logical choices. Th these are places where you have trade-offs and you need to do the balance to make sure it come out in, in the favor of what the society is trying to do. There's been a lot of talk today just in general about the cost of water and how perhaps the, you know, the cost of water to the consumer doesn't really include all those other costs that go into moving the water and, and the, the use of water. And how can that be communicated to the public? Well, uh, good question. And uh, the bottom line is most of the rates that we pay for water do include the pumping cost and the cost for the, uh, to amortize the uh, treatment capacity. What they don't include is what do you do for the next incremental s supply of water and the fact that as we go on, the levels to which we have to treat water are becoming more costly and the quality of water that we have available in a lot of cases is of lesser quality than we had before. So the bottom line uh, is from an overall resource availability. Uh, yeah, water is way underpriced in most areas. The other component though is, and this is a very important one, is look, talking about the geographical nature of things. There's a strong geographical nature of water. You just don't move water from one part of the country over to the other. Well, we pump oil all over the world. And again, that goes back to cost. A barrel of water is worth a few pennies. A barrel of oil is worth eighty dollars or whatever it closed at today you know and so that I, you know there, there's so many different factors that go into all this that we all just need to become more aware of them and make sure that we and particularly our policymakers understand these situations and understand the trade-offs that are involved so they can make intelligent decisions and can you tell me just a little bit about um, coming to an event like this and, and the value in being able to talk to the people that are attending the event about these issues I go to many different types of events, and I think what is unique about the uh, Emerging Technology Symposium is that we're getting a, a real cross-cut of professionals out here that work in both the plumbing and the mechanical side, as well as the resource side, and you're getting, uh, you're getting the people, as I say, where the rubber meets the road out there, and I think that is so important. All right, thank you very much. Okay.